in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Welcome to Islam for Dummies. Today, we will be talking about the Islamic punishment for adultery or stoning. Is it barbaric, as some people claim? Quite the contrary, we will see the mercy of Islam as the divine culmination of Judaism and Christianity. First, Islam alleviated mankind from this most severe punishment for nearly all crimes. Throughout ancient history, humanity was predominantly violent and unruly. Harsh measures were needed to deter evil acts, and advanced means were not yet developed for effective policing, detention, and rehabilitation. However, this does not justify the barbaric laws and practices of all ancient non-religious societies. And while Islam confirms the divine origin of the Old Testament, it is impossible to know for certain which of its punishments were indeed ordained by God, invented by the rabbis, or altered by the scribes. In the Old Testament, stoning was prescribed for many, many, many infractions such as committing adultery, fornication, worshipping other gods, inviting people to worship other gods, blaspheming, witchcraft, touching a mountain, breaking the Sabbath, disobeying your parents, and last but not least, not screaming loud enough while being raped. Islam lifted the burden of this most severe punishment for all crimes, except one, committing adultery, because of the devastating impact of marital infidelity on the very fabric of society, which will be discussed soon. And regarding fornication by unmarried people, Islam reduced the punishment to 100 lashes. Second, regarding the verse of stoning, God mercifully lifted its recitation and text from the Quran, while the legislation remained. To paraphrase Imam El Sayyuti from his book, Elit Ken, This verse was abrogated, while its application remained, to alleviate the nation, because it is the heaviest burden and the toughest, and the most severe punishment. In the Quran, stoning was only mentioned as a practice by evil people against the righteous. This is in stark contrast with the Bible, where all sorts of people were stoned, for the many, many, many reasons we mentioned earlier. Third, Islam's requirements regarding witnesses are so stringent that it is nearly impossible to obtain a conviction for adultery. For example, convicting someone in court of adultery requires four eyewitnesses of good character who saw the penetration of one sexual member into another. Not only is it very unlikely to find four people of good character who watched such an act together, but if less than four witnesses are produced, the witnesses themselves will be punished for the crime of slander. As a result, Enforcing any punishment for extramarital sex is nearly impossible in Islam. In fact, throughout all early Islamic leaderships, there was not even one single case where four people testified to witnessing adultery. And as for those who knew the punishment and confessed anyway, this was confirmed by the Prophet as the supreme repentance, worth that of an entire city. Therefore, as a punishment, stoning is not scary at all, because it can hardly ever be enforced. It is an effective deterrent, not out of fear, but because no Muslim would want to commit an act that, in the sight of God, deserves such a punishment. Fourth, this punishment applies only to Muslims who are not the ones complaining about it. 
Islam does not interfere with non-Muslims about the standards they set regarding adultery. Therefore, attacking Islam's stance on adultery is like trying to force Muslims to adopt the moral values or religious beliefs of others. And as for those who will still claim that the punishment against Muslims who commit adultery is too severe, we will now discuss the top three ways to avoid being stoned for adultery. Number three, be faithful to your spouse. Number two, do not confess to adultery four times. And number one, do not let four people of good character witness your act of adultery simultaneously in a well-lit room and from specific angles. Fifth, Islamic laws for adultery and fornication protect society far better than Western laws. The false claim is that Islamic laws on extramarital sex result in so-called honor killings. Firstly, taking the law into one's own hands is a violation of Islamic law. It is ridiculous to blame Islamic laws for people who are violating them. Secondly, the personal or family pride that would lead to such crimes is in itself a major sin in Islam. So again, it is ridiculous to blame Islamic laws for people who are violating them. Thirdly, such crimes are far more prevalent in Western societies because fornication is permitted, except they are called crimes of passion. Please read the following shocking U.S. statistics on the impact of permitting fornication. Now I'm alone, filled with so much shame For all the years I caused you pain If only I could sleep in your arms again Mother, I'm lost without you the sun that brightened my day now who's gonna wipe my tears away if only i knew what i know today mother i'm lost without you As a result, it is Western laws that permit fornication, resulting in devastating harm to millions of women and children. With these statistics in mind, only merciless hypocrites or sexual predators would attack Islam's superior protection to society. In conclusion, regarding fornication, Islamic law effectively protects society with virtually no enforceable punishment while Western law results in the tragedy of millions of innocent casualties. Islamic law makes it virtually impossible to prosecute anyone for adultery, yet Islamic societies have drastically reduced rates of fornication and the resulting harms, because no sincere Muslim wants to even deserve such a severe punishment in the sight of God. In contrast, Western laws permit and condone fornication, which is the root cause of the vast majority of crimes of passion, partner violence and rape, which have reached epidemic proportions in all Western societies. And the ridiculous claim that so-called honor killings have anything to do with Islamic law, which condemns them, is a desperately hypocritical attempt to vilify Islam. 
and as for those who attack Islam on this issue, they clearly have no regard for the importance of spousal commitments, nor for protecting society's women and children from the devastating harms of widespread fornication. We sincerely hope you enjoyed this episode of Islam for Dummies, and we hope to see you again next time.